This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Uh, as you all have noticed, I am Lorna Hardwick, and uh, uh, that's as far as my impersonation of Lorna ever manages to get. Um, uh, Lorna can't be here uh, the, the, this evening. She's uh, recovering um, from something quite painful and uh, sends her very uh, good wishes. She would certainly have wanted to be uh, in that chair tonight uh, because uh, she's extraordinarily interested in uh, uh, not only the subject of uh, translation uh, uh, more generally, but the work of these two uh, uh, writers will be uh, uh, talking this evening. Um, The format of this event, this series, is now, I think, probably familiar to many of the people in this room who are uh, returning survivors. Um, but not necessarily to the speakers. I'll just say for everyone that the plan is to give them about a 20-minute slot each in which they, uh, they, 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 up until now, uh, uh, we've had mixtures of readings and discussions of their work. They've they've got a master plan which Joe has completely stitched up with no help at all from us. Um, uh, uh, And then we'll, after they've both done their individual slot, we'll then open it up for questions. Uh, Ruth and Francesca have uh, provided on your handout um, some reading group style notes for questions that you might find it interesting to start thinking about um, if you can't in the unlikely event you can't think of any of your own. I should say that last, certainly last time, not one of their painstakingly drafted questions ever got asked because the discussion <laughs> went in uh, even more exciting directions, if that's possible to, uh, to imagine. Um, there's some bottles of wine and not wine at the back, which you cannot touch until we've had a full and rewarding discussion. But I hope you will stay around uh, for it afterwards. Uh, If you have mobiles, uh, please turn them off now. Um, We, uh, amongst other things, we have international monitors spectating here, and they will be deeply offended if you you don't show the kind of interest that they are showing from the other side of the world. Um, There's an attendance sheet which Ruth has there and is just brandished and is part around. Do sign yourself on that. Uh, It doesn't uh, commit you to disposing of your firstborn child in any uh, uh, seriously um, uh, contractual way, but it does ensure that the uh, uh, the Institute and Senate House continue to take us seriously. Um, And finally, and possibly most importantly of all, um, uh, our authors have brought piles of books which are available um, for sale afterwards. Um, They're sitting on the windowsill over there, and no, you may not touch them until you've listened to them uh, first. Uh, so it's a great pleasure to be um, to be Lorna, um, uh, uh, who has a much more interesting life than me, um, and certainly much more interesting friends. Um, it's wonderful uh, to uh, have the opportunity to introduce, and I'll just do them in the order that they're sitting here, but there's also the order that they're going to appear. Uh, Joe Barmer, who has been... Um, uh, who's, I, I, I realised to my horror I've been teaching her translations for 30 years now and this year in fact her, uh, some, some, some of her Sappho translations are the very first texts that Royal Holloway undergraduates get to see um, before even their lectures have started um, uh, we, we uh, throw them in at the deep end with a bit of Joe. Um, uh, but of course, those who've been following her career um, uh, will know that she's uh, moved um, uh, more and more widely from translation into uh, other kinds of use of antiquity. And in re- more recently, of course, she's been writing as a practitioner, uh, calm academic, about the experience uh, her, her long experience of uh, working with ancient texts and her monograph uh, p- uh, piecing together the fragments uh, which came out last year, was it? <coughs> uh, 2013, end of 2013. Right. Um, uh, is, is just one of the absolute must-reads on uh, the, uh, the processes that practitioners working closely with ancient texts uh, uh, go through. Um, and 
uh, on the far side, uh, we have Claire Pollard, who comes to the process of translation from an entirely different kind of angle, not um, initially through the languages, from the background in poetry, um, and in uh, writing for theatre and for radio, but whose uh, uh, translation of Ovid's Heroides is, which I'm, I will be known to many uh, here, is uh, really one of the landmark works of uh, uh, adaptation of uh, Latin poetry in the last few years. And uh, I think they're going to make a very interesting uh, pair. But Jo is going to kick off with 20 minutes of doing whatever it is she's about to do. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Nick. I'm going to stand up for this, if that's okay. Everybody. Okay, well, last week, I'm going to start with a post last week on the wonderful Feminism and Classics Facebook page, which I'm sure all of you are familiar with. And this directed me to an article by Jane Griffiths, who some of you might have come across, who's um, a Melbourne-based. Um, she's a classicist, an actor, dramatist, and a translator. And Jane was discussing the mostly gender-divided critical reactions to her new translation of Antigone. And she began by making the point, and I think it's very interesting in terms of, of what we're looking at tonight, she made the point that women are particularly suited for translation, she argued, because, as she put it, we are culturally programmed for it. She pointed out that from a very, very early age, we translate the male world around us and all the images that we might be bombarded with into our own version of reality, the reality that we know. Now, and if we think that times have changed, I was reminded this again last week, this again last week, when I read an interview with the Game of Thrones actress, um, Maisie Williams, isn't it? Um, in which she was complaining that when she got TV scripts in the linear notes, the male characters, um, their little linear notes would say something along the lines of Brad, witty, intelligent, excellent raconteur with a dark secret. Whereas the linear notes for the female characters usually said something along the lines of Beth, blonde, hot in a good way. <laughs> <laughs> and so we learn to create our own reality, to find new meanings for ourselves between these lines. And this, as Jane points out, as, as a classicist, is increasingly true when we come to read um, sort of iconic texts, iconic male texts, particularly classical texts and especially when we come to study them. For here we find that women are often silent, they're often demonised, and indeed very, very often absent. But I think there's another issue here too. In the past, and possibly again now, for all sorts of reasons, women are one of the groups that are being excluded, if you like, from a classical education. Um, and yet, translation and versioning has often provided women with a way in to that scholarship to which they've often been excluded. And often if they've been um, self-taught, like Elizabeth, uh, not self-taught, but taught in smaller groups or outside of the um, male academy, like Elizabeth Barrett Browning, for example. And so we find Lucy Hutchinson in the 1650s translating Lucretius and counting the syllables of his Latin, as she puts it, by the threads of her tapestry canvas. Um, in the 1920s, as H.D., who is threatening to terrify like furies the whole tribe of academic Grecians with her versions of Euripides. But as well as helping us as women to slip through the back doors, the ivory towers and dreaming spires, I think translation also provides a way, and I expect Claire will <coughs> this, um, for women to become, to, to misquote and eyes nin, spies in the house of poetry. It's a way in for us in what has often proved quite inhospitable and impenetrable bastion. Now, certainly, this was my own experience as a young postgraduate starting out in, um, as, a, as a writer and postgraduate in the, the early 1980s, that sort of lost decade of big hair and little style and absolutely no internet. <laughs> I, I knew I wanted to engage with classical texts, and I knew that I wanted to write poetry. But at the time, I really didn't see how the two could work together. Now then, women's studies was really in its infancy, particularly in classics. And translation was barely recognised, certainly not as a scholarly act, and, and not at all as a creative one. It was seen as little more as a brutal, grammatical exercise. 
but I did have Sappho. I've been fascinated with her poetry ever since reading an article in the children's comic, Look and Learn, an educational comic, which probably Nick and I are about the only people here who <laughs> still remember. Um, but in those days at UCL, where I was studying, Sappho was no more on our syllabuses than translation. And it seems hard to think now, but studies of her work were incredibly hard to find. And those that I could find in the library were dismissive of what they saw as her homely style, her lack of literary artifice, not to mention, of course, her deviant sexuality. But yet, feminist classicists such as Mary Lefkowitz and Judy Hallett, to name but two, they were beginning this long process of rehabilitation of women writers, women poets in the ancient world. And suddenly, in almost in a light bulb moment, I saw that translation, or rather my own translations, could play a part in this process. Now, Mary Lefkowitz cited in particular, as many of you might know if you've read her very famous article on Sappho 31, she cited Sappho 31 in particular as an example of the way in which um, translation had stripped the poem of its vividness, of its artifice. Now, Sappho 31, just to quickly explain if you don't know it, is the poem in which um, Sappho describes the physical effect of the beloved's presence on the lover. I knew then that I wanted to restore colour to the fate of papyrus. I wanted to give it back its fluidity and to give it at the same time, to retain at the same time that sort of strangeness, that, um, that ancientness, its foreignness. Okay, so I'm just going to read you my translation of Sappho 31. It seems to me that man is equal to the gods. That is, whoever sits opposite you and, drawing nearer, savours as you speak the sweetness of your voice and the thrill of your laugh, which have so stirred the heart in my own breast that whenever I catch sight of you, even if for a moment, then my voice deserts me and my tongue is struck silent. A delicate fire suddenly races underneath my skin. My eyes see nothing, my ears whistle like the whirling of a top, and sweat pours down me, and a trembling creeps over my whole body. I am greener than grass. At such times, I seem to be no more than a step away from death. But all can be endured, since even a pauper, dot, 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 and there, like so many others, the text just breaks off. But apart from the rehabilitation of often overlooked women's texts, there is another aspect to translation as a woman, and that is engaging with and the subversion of texts written by men, as Claire's also going to talk about later. Now, Catullus might seem like an extremely unlikely candidate to follow Sappho, whereas Sappho's work celebrates this emotional, close, sensual world of women. <coughs> Catullus' poetry is brutally male, and perhaps for this reason, is not a, a, a poet that's, all, that's ever really historically been very popular with women translators, and there actually are very few women who have translated him. It's hardly surprising. In poem 11, he calls his lover Lesbia a ball breaker. Um, even worse is poem 97. As for the women, he splutters, let's try to define them they would lick the arse of diarrheaed hangmen. It's not really the sort of stuff that women particularly find very attractive. But there was method in my madness. Catullus had himself been influenced by and translated Sappho's Greek, as you probably all know, particularly Sappho, Fragment 31. And it seems to me that approaching Sappho's poem again through Catullus's filter would be very fascinating and also very complex. Here were mirrors within mirrors, and I was asking myself, how could a male heterosexual version of female homosexual desire be rendered into English by a woman translator who had already previously worked on Sappho's original? Now, the first decision I made was to approach Catullus' poem, his version, as the entirely new poem in Latin that it so clearly is. Yet at the same time, I wanted to find a way of underlining the fact that my new version in English was now being approached, as it were, third hand. In this, um, uh, I wanted to 
um, convey uh, the irony of Catullus's poem, because his transformations on Sappho were for a very um, well-educated, literate Roman audience who would have known the sort of the transformations he was making on the text. They knew the original. They knew the jokes, as it were. So that sort of approach of Catullus's work could work in your favour. And I'd just like to read my translation first and then make a few points afterwards and just sort of stand against the Sappho. Catullus 51, Unseeing Lesbia, a translation of Sappho. That man to me seems the equal of a god. That man, dare I say, surpasses the divine. The one who sits by you, who time after time looks on you, who hears you as you laugh so sweetly. While I'm in hell, senses shredded, torn apart. For when I see you there, Lesbia, there's nothing left of me, no voice to speak of, as my tongue is numbed, my lips struck dumb. Pale fire trickles down my limbs, my ears resound, ring ting with their own thunder, and my eyes are covered by these dark nights, twin. Leisure is your death, Catullus, your despair. In leisure you ask too much of not enough, for at their leisure kings are lost, such ancient cities turn to dust. Now, here I was looking to um, create a very light knowing mood to evoke Sappho's sensual imagery beneath, like the palimpsest beneath. And to do that, I employed sort of teasing internal rhymes throughout, echoing the musicality of Sappho's Greek, as well as that of Catullus's Latin. I also used full and half end rhyme, which is a time-honoured way in English poetry to convey humour and irony. But if we move on quickly to Catullus's more abrasive poems on his women lovers, we see that these can be equally difficult, if not more so, for women translators. In poem 41, for instance, the poet is overcharged by what the commentators always call, rather coyly, a woman of the night, Amiana. And to add insult to injury, as he sees it, um, as he puts it, um, she isn't much of a looker. The poem turns on a final pun for the Latin ace, or bronze, which was also used figuratively, both of coinage and of a mirror. So we can see where he was going with this. While working on my translation, I was, for reasons that hopefully will become clear in a minute, I was looking for a rhyme for the word feeling. So I came up with the concept of a ceiling, both literally, as a room ceiling, and also um, figuratively, metaphorically, as a financial term. And immediately I was reminded of Mays West's famous riposte when she was asked why she had a mirror on her bedroom ceiling. As you probably all know, I can't do the accent. She said, oh, I like to see how I'm doing. <laughs> in echoing this in my version, if, if subconsciously at first, I think I was taking Catullus's poem out of the arena of male sexual insult into one of female sexual um, confidence and insouciance, sort of from the gutter, I suppose, to glamour. This is Amiana's delusions. Amiana, the girl who goes and goes, had the nerve to charge me 10,000 whole. You know, the girl with the big beaky nose, the one that bankrupt marmorous feeling. Call in her next of kin, put her in care, send out for her friends and physicians. For the girl is insane, she's not all there. She needs a brass mirror above the bed so she can reflect on her own ceiling. Okay. Now, I didn't realise it at the time, in this way, like every other translator before me, I was creating my own Catullus. And this Catullus was rather self-mocking, rather playful, rather teasing, less threatening, perhaps, than that of previous male translators, dare I say it, uh, demasculating, demasculinized, or <laughs> I don't quite know what the word would be, actually, um, even. Um, now, this is a very subconscious process, um, but nevertheless, I think it was a, a means, um, again, subconsciously, of making the poems more, slightly more approachable for women to read, for women to translate. As I wrote in my introduction to Catullus' Poems of Love and Hate, perhaps as a woman I could not take his belligerent posturing too seriously, but then neither one suspects did Catullus. But finding creative solutions can lead to creative work, as I discovered. And in addition, like Ezra Pound's persona, 
personae or masks, translation can offer a way to articulate difficult and private personal experience, as many contemporary poems have discovered. That's what they've often found in classical texts. And while I was working on my translations of Catullus, my young seven-year-old niece was diagnosed with a rare and very aggressive childhood cancer, from which, unfortunately, she later died. In my subsequent collection, Chasing Catullus, published concurrently with the Catullus translations, I found that I could only voice this grief through the prism of classical texts. Now, the scholar Charles Rowan Bay has commented that classical scholarship provides scholars with a profound place to hide, but so too, I discovered, could classical translation and versioning. Take, for example, the following poem from the collection, which is a fairly, if I might call it, straight extract from De Raptu Proserpinae, a very little-known Latin epic poem from the 5th century AD by the poet Claudian. As the title suggests, it tells the story of the myth of the abduction of the young Proserpina, or Persephone <coughs> in Greek, by Hades, <coughs> god of the underworld. De Raptu Proserpinae, 2nd of the 8th, 6.47 a.m. Now she came to the hills, wound round and round in grass. At first light, she picked her flowers. The earth shivered with dew. Violets slaked their newborn thirst. But as the sun advanced on its high noon sky, night fell like a thief, and our land trembled to the touch, trampled, dust-blown, under four sets of cloven hooves. Their horsemen we didn't know, harbinger, camp follower, or even death himself. But now our soft meadows bruised, rivers stopped mid-flow, fields rusted like forgotten ploughs. To breathe was suicide, trees drained of green, roses shed their petals, lilies shriveled before our eyes. And then he turned away, swinging round the reins like the gates of hell, grating to a close. Night scuffled after, as the light seeped back into our black world. Everywhere was light, sun and sky and light, and your small daughter, nowhere to be seen. <coughs> now, Niobe, the poem which follows this in the sequence, was more radical. It takes as its basis just a very, very few phrases from Sophocles' Antigone, and these allude briefly to the legend of the mother turned to stone as she grieves for the death of her seven children. In Sophocles' original, the lines just read as follows. Antigone is talking about Niobe. Her death, merciless as the ivy, rain and snow beat down on her, mingled with tears. For my poem, I elongated and elaborated on this brief snatch. And where Sophocles had located these um, events in the mountainous remote um, north of Greece, I relocated them to the equally remote far west of Cornwall, which is our family home. This is Niobe. Niobe, 2nd of the 8th, 7.22 a.m. Like a cloudburst on a Penwith day that had to come, yet still startles, shocks. Think of granite veined with pale rose quartz, a fret of stone where the brackens frayed by aching flint pierced moorland streams. The bind of ivy, the prick of gorse, hedged in with comfrey, helbury, sob of rain, scar of hail, Snow shrinking to sigh, the sound of words you can't say. The sound of words you can't say, this seems to me is what translation is or can be or can do. For here we see how classical translation and versioning provided me with a, a, a means to articulate different emotions, difficult and difficult emotions that I would not otherwise have been able to do, to provide um, Charles Bay's place to hide. But as Jane Griffiths had seen, I was also translating my own and my family's life. And as many versions and poems in the collection um, explore, I felt uneasy at this and the appropriation, even by myself, of these very, very personal experiences. And after completing Chasing Catullus, I wanted to move away from the deeply personal. And so in my 2009 collection, The Word for Sorrow, rather than drawing on my own life experience, I interspersed versions of Ovid's poems of exile in Tristia, 
with poems exploring the story of my old second-hand dictionary being used to translate them. In particular, I discovered through that wonderful scholarly act of a Google search that my dictionary's original owner, who'd written his name in the flyleaf as a schoolboy in January 1900, had later fought in the First World War campaign of Gallipoli, which was quite close to Ovid's own place of exile at Tomis on the Black Sea, and Ovid in one of his poems actually describes going past there. But like Tullus, Ovid, as Claire will no doubt be telling us more in a minute, is a very tricky customer, as you all know. And the more I worked on Tristia, and the more I read about it, the more I realised that far from a straightforward lament of exile, a place where the mask of Latin artifice slips, in fact, here was a highly artificial text. So much so that some scholars have suggested that Tristia is one of the first literary hoaxes in literature, in history, written by Ovid, not from exile in Tomis, but from the safety of his um, country house in Italy. Now, whatever the truth of this, it's certainly a text packed full of um, intertextual references, of sharp changes in register. Um, it's self-pitying wails of grief are studded with jokes, puns, and sly wit, as any of you who've ever read it will know. All of which can see, these changes in register can sit very uneasily in our own literary tradition, and I'm sure that's the reason why it's never really been all that popular, especially in the recent past. But for me, this again is where translation can come into its own. As with Catullus, my strategies as a translator, as a versioner, as a poet, could underscore both the original's own shifts and fluid intertextualities, and as well as my own response to them as its sort of subverting woman translator. For instance, in the poem Naso the Barbarian, the exiled Ovid reflects on his cultural isolation. As a version, it might seem like an integral whole, but in fact its first stanza is based on Tristia 5-7, and, th and even then just takes eight out of that poem's 69 lines in order to stress the poet's sense of cultural and literary um, and linguistic isolation. And the second stanza is based on an entirely different poem altogether, and that is um, poem uh, Tristia 5-1, and here I concentrated really just on one line, line 37, which is quite famous, because here is where Ovid makes the dramatic and almost certainly ironic statement that here it is that I am a barbarian, barbarous hic ego sum. In my version, this became a transgressional, post-colonial act of self-knowledge. This is Nezo the Barbarian. I see a world without culture, savage, bleak, a world weighted by sorrow. <coughs> so men become beasts with no fear of law, justice vanquished in war, learning commerce tainted now by Gitic birth. My own voice is spent, this poet's coinage, my native speech bankrupted, impoverished. So I talk to myself, deal in borrowed words for this doomed art, the currency of my verse. And then, watching the tribesmen in the markets, bartering for goods in their common language, while I communicate by mime or gesture, a thought occurs. Who is the barbarian here? Um, now, despite my aim uh, to move away from personal poetry, as the collection progressed, the sequence progressed, I found my own voice was beginning to intervene in the text more and more. And more importantly, I also came to understand how a translator could become a protagonist in their own narrative and how the, pro the processes of translation could become my subject matter in their own right. For instance, in the following poem, it begins with a short translation of a passage, very straight translation, of a passage from Tristia 432, in which the exiled Ovid hears of the Emperor Augustus's uh, triumphs in a very bloody campaign in Germany, which echoed the, the um, subject matter of many of the World War I poems in the collection. And then this then leads to my own meditation on the uses of the dictionary in defining such horrors. This is dictionary definitions. Construct the landscape of slaughter, lakes, hills, forts, flesh-clogged river, the Rhine too, fractured, splintered, downed with bodies and running red with its own blood. 
My job now to distinguish Kaides from Kruor, the one carnage, slaughter, a battle massacre, and the other simply blood, that which flows from the wound. And then there's Lugubria, almost comic in English, but solemn here, of or belonging to mourning. And in the plural, substantive, mourning clothes, weeds for widows, this shroud of Latin, amesus mortuus, the dragging leaden cloak of language, missing in action, presumed dead. And I'd just like to end now with the, the title poem from Chase and Catullus, which explores the lure of translation and versioning, versioning if tongue-in-cheek as befits its namesake. Um, this art of translation, which Anne Carson so rightly described as being in a room not exactly familiar, where one gropes for the light switch. This is Chasing Catullus. It's the rule of attraction, the corruption of texts, the way his corpus tastes of skin and sweat, that taint of decay, scent of cheated death. But then, I've always liked them old. Past hearts, lost minds, redundant souls. Just enough to get me fleshing ghosts, giving them tongue, jumping their bones. Yet, sleep with the dead, and you'll wake with the worms. Stripped down, compressed, a little accusative, slightly stressed, to find the code you crack, the claws that breaks, is no longer subordinate. It's now your own. Thank you. If you have questions, hold that thought. We're going straight into Claire. Thank you, that was fantastic. Um, I love the idea of Tristy being a literary hoax, I've never heard that before, it's amazing. Um, okay, um, so I'm just going to, um, well just to start talking a little bit about my own process translating Ovid. Um, I should say at the start I, I don't speak Latin, it wasn't taught at my school, I've never considered myself much of a linguist. Um, what I have done, though, before as a poet is I've translated from Hungarian and Somalian quite a lot, neither of which language I speak either. Um, I got embroiled in a, a British Council project, and I now do quite a lot of work for a, an institution called Poetry Translation Centre. And what they do is they um, provide me with literals from a, a native speaker that are just very, very rough, basic guides to meaning. And then I listen to the original, look at the original, I ideally hear the poet read it, ask lots of questions, and my job is to make it work as a poem in English. Um, so that's kind of how I, I worked on the Heroides. Um, I didn't have the, the money to, to get someone to provide me with a literal, but what I did use is a very old prose translation as, as my kind of literal. I used the kind of 1930 lower... Uh, version of the Heroides. Um, and I worked with that and the Latin and a, a dictionary at my side, looking up, you know, a lot of the words, at least 50% of the words I was looking up for a dictionary. After the while, I started to, I did start to get a feel for what some of them meant. Um, and then, um, because I was paranoid that I'd be making lots of mistakes, when I'd done my first version, I then did read every other version I could lay my hand on cross-check, um, that I hadn't misinterpreted the meaning of anything. But my job really was to make it work as a poem in English, to make it uh, alive and dramatic and as good as I thought it was in English, which I felt none of existing translations were doing. Um, early on, uh, part of that was making a decision about form. Um, he writes, of course, in elegiac couplets, and in English translators often try to echo this by using some kind of metrical couplet quite often iambic, sometimes rhyming, sometimes not. Um, I often do try to replicate form when I'm translating. Um, for example, when I translate from the Somalian, it's, it's very like old Anglo-Saxon poetry. They have long lines with a kind of zero in the middle quite often, and it's alliterative. And I do try to put that back in when I make my versions from the Somalian. Um, and my Hungarian translations often rhyme because it's very culturally important. Um, however, in a long translation like this, I thought, that, you know, the, 
trying to impose medical restrictions would involve lots of other compromises with the material. And it had been done. I mean, Harold Lispel does a, a good job at, at, at doing a kind of iambic um, couplet. So I decided to go free verse, following Ted Hughes, who's a kind of hero of mine. And partly because no translation had done the heroides in free verse before, and partly because it allowed me to really enjoy and let loose with other aspects of Ovid's poetry, I suppose, the, the pacing, the repetitions, the conversational tone, the humour, the, you know, it's much easier to tell jokes if you're not constrained, constrained by Peter all the time, um, the kind of immediacy of the voices, which was so engaging for me. Um, I wouldn't really have dared to do a classical translation um, if it hadn't sort of found me, if it hadn't this book hadn't kind of presented itself to me as a kind of almost a gift. Um, when, I, when I first got it out from the library um, on a whim, um, I, was, I was just going to Rome and I thought, oh, I'll read some of it and picked it off the shelf. I, when I started to realise what it actually was, um, a retelling of the Greek and Roman myths from the perspective of the women, you know, Phaedra and Dido and all these amazing characters that I was fascinated by, I, I kind of couldn't believe it, really. I was... I was why hadn't I heard of this text? I didn't understand why I, I, I didn't know it. Um, the translation in my hands was a 1971 rhyming version by Harold Cannon, which I think, I, I hope no one knows it, but I think it's fair to say it's the worst version. But I can tell even, even through the kind of clunky rhyming that there was something really amazing here. Um, and when I looked into it, there, you know, the, the, there wasn't, a, I didn't think, a translation that that did what I, that fulfilled the potential I could see there. And indeed, it seemed like the book had fallen radically out of fashion and was seen as very minor. Um, even though, you know, it's a radical act of literary transvesticism, it's um, been considered the first book of dramatic monologues and the first of epistolary fiction, it, it feels very modern, almost postmodern, with the way it tells stories from very radical, really different subjective perspectives. Um, it was once his most loved text, and it influenced Chaucer, Dante, Marlowe, Shakespeare, it's translated by Dryden and Pope. Um, but instead, all I found was a lot of academic writing. Just and there's an example, someone called Brooks Otis talked of the wearisome complaint of the reft maid and the monotonous iteration of her woes. Florence Viducci said, even the most closely reasoned and dispassionate argument for the poetic merit of Ovid's collection will whisper of the marketplace, the boutique for overpriced and at best second-rate antiquities. Um, this is Ovid, you know, he's like, he's inventing four genres. I have some respect was my, um, was my <laughs> impulse in the library, I can believe. Um, I mean, it's, you know, it's flawed because it's so ambitious, but it's, a, you know, it's a work of genius. Come on. Anyway, <laughs> before, um, before I perform one of the monologues, I'll just touch a bit more on gender as well, because I know that's the kind of topic of tonight. And of course, it was partly as a feminist I was drawn to this text. Um, the first thing I thought is it's exact, it had this huge resemblance to a lot of the feminist kind of revisionist storytelling that um, I grew up on and that were my favourite texts as teenagers, like Angela Carter's Bloody Chamber or, or Caroline Duffy's The World's Wife that came out when I was a teenager. Um, of course, though, it is more complicated than that because it is an act of literary transvesticism. Something that, you know, Plato warned against as a subversive act. I found a great quote in The Republic in, in Tom Griffiths' translation. Imitating a woman, young or old, may be abusing her husband or competing with the gods and boasting about her good fortune, or in the grip of disaster or grief or mourning, will not be a legitimate activity for the people we say we are interested in, the ones we want to grow up into the right sort of men. They are, after all, men, and still less do we want them imitating a woman who is ill or in love or in childbirth. <laughs> um, it's like Ovid used this as it's converted with the blur for his book, you know. <laughs> he takes off every, pretty much every single one of those, I think, um, in the course of the Heroides. Um, it, you know, it's hard not to wonder if, if the quotation was almost a spur. You know, I think, you know, we, we don't know Ovid's motivation for writing this very complicated text. Um, and part of it might have been to shock, I think. And he's undoubtedly showing off 
displaying the skill with which he can subvert and freshen existing myths and his ability to do impersonations of the female voice, you know. I think there's an element of... It's very interesting, actually, if you look cross-culturally at... Um, there's, there's a whole history of literary transvesticism. There's a lot, you'll find a lot in um, <coughs> Japanese and Oriental poetry. You'll find quite a lot in um, German poetry. They have a, a tradition, it's called like the woman, the Frauenlieber or something, the women's song. Um, you find that a lot of our early Anglo-Saxon poems, some have argued, are written by men in the voices of women. Um, there is this tradition, and you wonder if it's partly um, partly showing off, you know, if, if a dramatic monologue is about taking on the voice of another, to take on the voice of someone radically other shows more skill. Um, but there's lots of other theories too, whether it's, um, you know, by using female masks, uh, they could kind of say things that they wouldn't be allowed to say as men, perhaps, show more vulnerability or co complain or express loneliness and so on. Um, Ovid also, though, undoubtedly loved the company of women and <laughs> to me, um, his poems do show remarkable empathy, and I think um, we should give him some credit for that. There is even kind of anger at the way society treats women. Um, you know, you, of course you can't call him feminist. And I know a lot of feminists have problems with Ovid. I mean, there's been the recent uh, tri trigger warning stuff in America, a lot of it's circled around Ovid's text. Um, there is a lot of rape in his poetry, there's no getting around that. And there, um, and some of his women are cruel or dumb, or they, they're not very nice to each other, they call each other sluts quite a lot in this book. But on the other hand, they, what he does create is these incredibly complex, often very sympathetic, three-dimensional, intelligent women. Um, and the men come off far worse, I would say. <laughs> men come off far worse in this book. Um, there's certainly a tongue-in-cheek awareness of the criticism of it might attract with this project, um, particularly in the Herodes, in the letter from <coughs> Dianeira to her husband Hercules, um, after she's become aware of rumours that he's been enslaved by the Queen of Lydia and forced to dress up in women's clothes. And, and she says, trickles of gossip soon muttered of necklaces around your thick neck. Are you shameless? Braceleting your brawn with golden jewels, to think your muscles squeeze the lion whose pelt you wear, yet you weave women's ribbons through your hair, and modelling the Lydian belt like Miss Playful, you're sick, sick. Um, and it's hard not to read that poem and see those accusations thrown at the poet. Um, but by drawing parallels between himself and a dragged up Hercules, he just kind of gets to preempt his critics with, with humour, I think. And at the same time, posture as a hero whose muscular masculinity is only comically heightened by such role play, I suppose. Dianeira demands, could you tell anecdotes in a fashionable gown? Did cross-dressing not affect your voice? And that, perhaps, for Robin, is the more interesting question. Cross-dressing on some level should affect his voice. That's what shows the skill of the dramatic monologue. Um, but Plato's anxieties are simmering there, too. Might Writing so many poems in feminine guise somehow muted his talent. Um, for me, it's this kind of balancing act between the male and female voice, which is very precarious, which makes the Herodes so interesting. He generally, he chooses not to tone down his kind of rhetorical and poetic brilliance. And some critics have seen this as a flaw, you know, Ovid's voice is showing through. But actually, what you get is, is brilliant, <laughs> intelligent, witty heroines. Um, and after all, how, how does a woman speak? And this is something we might talk about in the questions. It's very, it's very interesting. A lot of people have this idea there's a feminine way of talking, a masculine way of talking. But that's not something that actually I've ever identified with, really. I think in many ways, um, the way I talk, many of my speaking traits might be identified as masculine if we're going to go down that road. <laughs> You know, I'm, I, I like banter, I, I like kind of intellectual arguments and I have a bad habit of talking over people when I've had too many drinks, watch out for that later. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I've always been interested in the idea of the writer as androgynous in a way, in a way that's posited by Virginia Woolf or someone like Anne Carson, we mentioned, who positions herself as, she identifies almost as a gay man. She says. Um, I think I love the Herodes because for me it felt quite natural to be a woman being a man being a woman. Um, 
In the same way, though, uh, it, it's worth noting that literary transvestism always contains a kind of structural irony. There's this very clear distance between poet and persona that makes it easier for us to read things as sardonic, perhaps. And I'm aware that because I'm a woman, in translating the Herodes, I've caused that irony to partially collapse. <coughs> when I'm, um, you know, performing uh, in the Fedra, and I've got, you know, my own baby bump, which I did have when I started performing it, or I've got my, my son mewling in the background, which I did at my launch, um, you know, I enable the reader to hear the woman and temporarily forget the man in the middle, in a way. I think I make it easier for people to take the poems on face value and hear the genuine passion without automatically seeing inverted commas. Does that mean I get closer to the original or further away? I don't know in a way. I don't think at this historical distance, you know, it's very hard to read the tone of voice or catch the glint in the eye. I'm not sure. Um, okay, I'm going to read uh, one of the... There'll be more time for discussion, but I should get on. So I'm just going to perform... Uh, one of the monologues, um, and I'm going to perform, as I say, overconfidently, because I have it by heart, um, I'm going to perform the day. Okay. <clears throat> and yet for you, I recall, I, Medea, queen of cultures, could find time when you asked me for help. That was when three sisters who spin out fate should have unwound my thread, better to die then, everything since has been punishment. Why did that ship made from Pelion's wood, rowed by young arms, seek the golden fleece? Why did we cast eye upon the Argo? Why did your cruise up the waters of Phasis? Why did I delight in your blondness, your charm, the false grace of your tongue? Yet yeah, I did delight, too much. Or when your ship was beached to unload your heroes, yourself, you'd have met bulls with burning breath without anointment by my spells, would have scattered such seeds you would have planted death. How much treason, you scum, would have died with you? I would not suffer as I do. There is pleasure in reproaching me, ungrateful with favours done. It is my only fun. In your untried craft you came and landed on our rich shore where I was what your new bride is today, her father's wealthy, so was mine. He entertained your green youths, you lolled your limbs on his embroidered couch. It was then I saw you, began to know you, began my downfall. I saw you and was undone, not with ordinary fire, but the fire of pine torches lit for worship. And you were handsome, true, but fate dragged me down to your eyes, blinded my eyes. You knew it, traitor, didn't you? Love can't hide, its flame betrays itself. Erty, speech finished. Everyone stood sadly, removed the table, the violet draped couch. How far away your thoughts were then from Creusa or a dowry or her proud father. You left in fear and as you went, your eyes were wet, your mouth could scarcely shake goodbye. I lay in my bedroom. All night I hurt and cried. I saw the beast, the dreadful crop, the snakes and blinking eyes. I felt my fear and love and fear increase his love. At dawn, my dearest sister found me face down in despair with loosened hair, tears everywhere. She asked aid for your argonauts. She prayed and I implored and you were saved. Where was your rich dowry then? Where was your royal bride of a theory? It was I, the woman now barbarian to you, poor and hateful, who closed the lids of scorching eyes with drugs that brought on sleep and gave you your beloved fleece. I fleeced my father, left my throne, my home, my prize was exile, thief. You took my innocence. I missed my mother and my sister, but my brother, I didn't leave him behind. I can't write it. My hand's strong enough to do it, but not write it. I should have been torn limb from limb, too, with him, but beyond fear I never feared, trusting myself and my guilt to the sea. Where is justice? Where are the gods? We should have been drowned for our treachery and trust. I wish the clashing rocks had caught and crushed our bones so mine were mashed with yours. That Scylla's dogs are gorged on us, it's fit she kills ungrateful men. That she that sucks and spews have brought us too beneath the Sicilian waves. But no, safe, victorious, you return to your town, laid the fleece down before your gods. And must I tell again of Peleus' daughters, how they hacked their father into pieces? Others blame me, but you mustn't. My crime was that I tricked those girls for you, yet you dared, words fell my fury, you dared to say, leave our palace. At your bidding, I left with our two children and that stalker love when suddenly we heard a wedding chant, and my eyes saw glinting torches and pipes poured notes for you, a wedding song for me more painful than a funeral dirge, things tilted. I didn't yet believe in such wickedness. 
But still my chest grew chill, and as the crowd pressed on, cried Hymen, O Hymenaeus, the cry more dreadful, the closer it got, our slaves wept, but tried to hide their tears, who'd break such ill news. And it's true that I hadn't known, but my heart was heavy as if I knew. And when our youngest child, keen to see, stood on the door's outer threshold, cried, Mummy, come out, there's a procession. Daddy leads it in bright gold, driving the horses. I slashed my cloak, I beat myself, I scraped my face with merciless nails. I could not help but storm the mob and rip garlands from pretty hair. I scarce could keep from screaming, hair all torn, he's mine and holding you. Be happy, my poor father, my country. Ghost of my brother, here's your payment. I've lost my title, thrown in home. My husband, who for me was all of them. It seems I can tame serpents but not a man. I held back heat with my enchantments, but cannot stand the melt of my own lust. My incantations, herbs and art have forgotten me. Nobody can help. Pope Hecate does nothing. There's no happiness in day, nights are bitter vigils, gentle sleep's gone too. I charm dragons to doze, but can't do this for myself. I can aid others, not myself. The limbs I saved entwine around a horse. She eats the fruit. Perhaps, when you show off for your silly wife, you will insult my foreign ways and face to please her. Well, let her laugh. Let her mock on her high purple bed. Soon she'll scream and blister far worse than me. Whilst filed sword and poison are near my hand, no enemy of mine will go unpunished. But if you can still be touched by pleas, hear these words. Words too meek for my proud self. I am a supplicant to you as you have been to me. I cast myself at your feet. If I seem cheap, be kind to our children. She'll be a hard stepmother. They look like you too much. When I see them, tears drop from my eyes. I beg by the gods, by my grandfather, the sun, our sons and all I've done, restore me to the bed for which I lost everything. Help me as I help you. I don't ask you to fight bulls, men and swords. It is you I asked for, you I earned, you who gave yourself to me and made me a mother. Where is my dowry? I counted it out on the field you turned over to take the fleece. The golden ram is my dowry, though if I ask to store it, you'd refuse. My dowry is yourself alive, my dowry is your crew. Go, bastard! Compare that to the wealth of Sisyphus, that you breathe to take wife and be ungrateful. You owe to me. Listen well, but wait, why should I let you know the price? Where this rage leads, I will follow. Perhaps I will repent, but I repent caring for you. I leave it for the God who churns my heart. I do not know what power moves my mind. And you know, that's probably the first time any of us have ever seen that poem performed. Uh, so it's actually rooted very deeply in the theatrical uh, tradition. Amazing. Um,